So, as Philip said, we're working in the Woody Draws uh, on the MPG Ranch. Uh, they are a prominent feature across arid regions of Montana as well as the Great Basin. Uh, they are generally not a true wetland because they lack the anaerobic soils uh, to be delineated as such, but they still form, um, perform the same ecological functions or many of the same ecological functions as a riparian uh, community or system would do, including erosion and water re erosion control, water retention, uh, supporting a diverse and unique set of uh, vegetative communities which in turn support a diverse um, and concentrated uh, wildlife community. Overgrazing and uh, herbicide af applications have uh, reduced the shrub cover in many uh, woody draw systems. This is a picture from the MPG Ranch, um, as well as increased erosion, erosion problems and uh, introduced native, non-native plant communities. So as I think Mike talked about earlier, MPG has undertaken a number of active restoration projects on the ranch in the woody draws uh, in particular, um, starting with some prescribed burning to remove a lot of that biomass of non-native vegetation, followed by herbicide applications, uh, erosion, and erosion control installations that you can see in the top right there, those little funny lines. Um, and then uh, not native shrub and tree planting that Mike talked about, as well as uh, some fencing to uh, fence out the herbivores, as you can see on some of these little guys. Wait, there they are, those little fences. So the spatial arrangement, actually, before I say this, I want to back up and say one of the, the broad goal is that improving ecosystem function, as we just heard about earlier. Um, and one of those functions is supporting associated wildlife communities, including birds. The spatial arrangement of habitat features influence the abundance and distribution of bird populations. So uh, breeding birds are territorial. So the gray blob represents a bird territory. I'm not a very good artist. Um, and as you can see there, that territory constrains or uh, limits their access to resources. Um, so if we look at a bird's territory before restoration and after restoration, uh, we can better understand how the, those fine scale habitat features uh, influence the associated bird community at a fine spatial scale of the individual territory. And this uh, demonstrates what typically you would expect to occur as you increase the desirable resources. You have smaller uh, territory sizes and more territories packed into a smaller area. So on the right, you oh, push the wrong button. On the right, you can see you have three territories as opposed to the one large one. So the traditional uh, method for territory mapping called spot mapping is to actually go out and flag out a grid across your study area and then take a piece of paper out and write down um, on the paper the location and behaviors of all the birds that you see. And that's all the scribbling that you see on the right. Um, this is considered the best method for uh, determining bird densities and uh, is af actually often used as truth to compare point count data to for the absolute density of birds. Um, it's also been criticized as being time consuming. You take all these papers, you go out a whole bunch of times, and then you have to transcribe them all into one piece of paper. Um, and also somewhat inaccurate, there's limitations to how well you can mark the birds where they truly were on the ground um, in relation to features using this method. There's scale constraints for how small you can draw. So. So the objectives of this project were to first test a novel technique for mapping bird locations in relation to those land features using a digital mapping device, which I'll talk about more. And then second, to evaluate breeding bird spatial distribution and density in relation to the restoration and woody habitat features at fine spatial scales. And the intent of this is to inform future restoration through a better understanding of bird distributions in relation to those really fine habitat features that you're, you know, those individual plantings and the scale of restoration is often quite small. So the study was conducted on five 
uh, woody draws within the MPG, MPG ranch. The yellow line is the property boundary. So you can see we actually sampled two draws that extend beyond the property of the ranch. Um, the draws extend from the riparian floodplain through that sort of grassland, shrubland uh, area. And then we, we stopped our sampling at the upper limit of, of those open areas where the conifer took over. Um, there's a total of 12 kilometers across all the sites. Uh, we had three controls and two treatments, the sheep camp and tongue treatments. And I wish that I had actually Mike's slide because he had a really great slide that showed the, the active restoration areas. And they don't, they are a little smaller than this map represents. So when, when I say treatments down here, that part of them are going to be controls and part are going to be treatments because the I think the active restoration on this one goes all the way up, but I think on this one it goes up to some point and then stops in there. So we had five focal species: the lazuli bunting, gray catbird, dusky flycatcher. Uh, those are three shrub nesters, and then two ground nesters: the orange crown warbler and the spotted towhee. We selected these because they're all associated with shrub habitats. And they, we, they're known to incur in the, in the woody draws um, on MPG Ranch based on previous point count data. We selected the Apple iPad as our data collection of, uh, device because it's relatively co low cost compared to some of the, the high-end GPS units that you can get, get with uh, mapping capabilities. Um, they are wide, widespread. Everybody has one. Some people's preschoolers have them. And uh, they have a touchscreen inter interface, which makes it easy to do uh, precise mapping. We also worked with a project-specific software application that was developed uh, with GCS Research, which is a local group here in Missoula. And uh, one of the priorities of this app development was that it could be <coughs> widely used on the ranch for bird studies and potentially for other studies. And, I, you know, we've really talked about it primarily for birds, but it could have broader applications as well. So we worked closely with uh, Kate Stone and, and MPG on the development of this. Uh, the units were loaded with high resolution aerial imagery. Uh, bird locations were mapped relative to the visible habitat features on those images, as well as uh, behavioral observations, territorial observations, uh, interactions with neighbors. So this just shows an example of what the data looks like as we collect it. We stick our finger on the map, on the shrub we see for the bird, and then we say whether it was a visual, whether the, the bird was singing, whether it had food for its young, any of those uh, signs of breeding. That's what that dot is for. And then uh, we also did intensive nest searching on a weekly basis to get a better understanding of where nests were located, which help inform territory delineation and a better sense of overall breeding activity within each of the sites. So uh, in 2013, we uh, did at least uh, six visits to each site. Um, and you can see there's variation in the number of detections. This is total detections for all the focal species combined. Um, whoa, I always push the wrong button. Uh, Baldy had the most detections, and Tongue had the fewest. And you can see that on the maps as well. The, there was also variation in the number of total detections by focal species. So gray catbird here, we only got a few of them way up here. And uh, spotted towhee, we had tons of them, and they were everywhere. And this bottom site, just to remind you, is that Tongue. So you can see that there are a few spotted towhees on that. A couple of other species showed up, but basically we didn't get anything, any focal species in those, in that draw. Um, and this is just to show, again, this is all the different colors are different focal species. And I just wanted to show how clustered they are on visible, uh, mature, woody vegetation. So again, these are, this is that North Sheep Camp, and sheep camp draws, and you can see all the green underneath the dots. And then here's that tongue, and there's just there's nothing there. So surprisingly, there's no shrub-associated bird community. Nest searching. Uh, this I show the data for 
2012 as well as 2013 here, we've got really low success on finding nests. Um, some of that is just the limitation of the amount of habitat that's currently out there on the ground. Some of it is the challenge when there is really good habitat, it's really, really dense and you, you can hardly get into it. So you can see where the birds are flying in and out with food. You can get a sense of where their nest is, but it's really hard to actually find that, that nest. So uh, one of the things we're gonna do next year is, is really up our nest searching effort and see if we can improve those numbers. But we got 12 total nests in 2013. Um, for four out of the five species, we found no nests for gray catbirds. And then the map on the right shows that the, the nest locations vary by site. And again, tongue, as you would expect, has no nests because there are no birds hanging out there. Um, some of the other areas have a lot of, had a lot of detections and they also had a lot of nests that we were able to locate. Um, the red dot shows failed nests. Green triangles are success. So there's a mix of those. There's a lot of nests here and none of them that we found successfully fledged. So nest fate across both years uh, was pretty low for most of the species with the exception of spotted toys where we had a 60% success rate. Um, the rest of them are pretty low. We found evidence of brown-headed cowbird parasitism in the nest. We found one dusky flycatcher nest out of three that had a cowbird and was abandoned, cowbird egg. Um, and we found three parasitized Lasley buntings out of, out of the six that we total found. So half of them had uh, cowbird eggs. One of them actually here successfully fledged a, a Lasley bunting, fledged out of this, even with the egg you can see in the background with the nestling. Um, and here again, you can see the egg. This is the cowbird egg. This is the Lasley bunting egg. So these rates are, um, for both these species, the, the flycatcher is considered an uncommon uh, host for brown-headed cowbirds, but work, previous work in the Bitterroot has found, found some evidence of it. Eric Green did some work in the Bitterroot with Lasley Buntings in the mid-90s, and he found 100% of the nests that he looked at had cowbirds. So uh, this is a problem larger than just the MPG ranch draws. So this shows uh, the territories that we were able to delineate in 2013 are in yellow, and the territories from 2012 are in green. Um, basically what we did is we imported all those locations that we collected on the unit into GIS, and I was able to use that to, to separate out territories using the standard uh, traditional territory mapping approach, which is that you need a minimum of three location, territorial lo locations from three separate visits or a nest to delineate a territory. Um, and so for dusky flycatchers, we had 10 territories delineated in 2013. We found evidence of breeding activity in three of those. Um, in this case, they were all nests that we actually found. So for the three three instances of breeding activity that we were able to observe, we found the nests in all three cases. So in that case, you know, I, there should be, an, you would think there'd be a nest here, there should be nests in each of these breeding territories, but we never did see any uh, sign of feeding or uh, a, a obvious evidence of, of young in those cases. Gray catbirds, uh, in 2012, we had four territories. Uh, one of those is, this tiny little dot, which was delineated based on um, observation of a female feeding recently fledged young. So very little, it may actually be these guys moved up. So I really think probably three, and then here was a little evidence of some nestlings, but we had very little evidence even in 2012. In 2013, even less. These actually, all these dots are from the same day, because you might say, well, there's four dots, you should have been able to delineate a ter territory, but they weren't from three separate visits. There are one day, same bird. Lasley Buntings, we had seven ter 17 territories that we were able to delineate, and we observed breeding activity in five of those. And the Orange Crown Warbler, we had five territories breeding activity in one. 
And then the spotted towhee, which had the largest number of total detections, we were able to delineate 38 territories and breeding activity in nine of those. So based on the number of observations on tongue, we, we were able to get one territory there on the upper edge where there's a little pocket of habitat. There's also one little pocket of habitat right here, and we saw a towhee there one day, and that was it. So there's definitely not enough shrub uh, vegetation here to support any of the focal species we're looking at. Uh, whereas on all these others, you can see this is a good species to get a, a good sense of kind of where the habitat is because they were so abundant. You can see there's plenty of habitat in the upper reaches of these draws, but the lower reaches are very similar to tongue. And then the two over here have a little bit more habitat, though it's patchy currently. So in conclusion, the digital territory mapping using the iPad and the specialized application was easy and efficient to use, which Kate's gonna say, what are you talking about? But I mean, once the app is developed, it's really easy to use it. Until it's, the process of developing the app was really long and, and challenging. There were some issues, battery life of the iPad. Uh, it sucks a lot of battery when you have the GPS going. If you're trying to spend a whole day out in the field, you have to really think about battery life. Uh, screen visibility, they're not designed to be in the field. Uh, so they don't perform really well under direct sunlight. Um, and then, as I mentioned, the application development as a process. Um, second, focal species place territories in relation to the existing vegetation, as we could see um, in the territories we were able to delineate. Um, in the future, we're hoping to actually map the vegetation on the ground uh, with MPG staff so that we can actually quantify what that relationship is. Right now we get to look at the pictures and say, oh, it looks like they're on top of the shrubs. But I'd like to do something a little um, deeper than that in the future. And then over time, we're really excited to see how those territories shift in response to the on-the-ground restoration that's happening in the draws. Um, with that, I'd like to acknowledge all the uh, technicians and interns that collected the data with us, MPG Ranch staff, GCS, and of course our home wildlife biology. Thanks.